Let me make sure the cameraman is ready. Yep. Okay, I, I think today is one of uh, the first of three department colloquia that will have four faculty presentation for, per colloquia uh, to give you a, a sort of a sneak preview of what the faculty are working on. I uh, get the session started for today. Let me get the lights on. My name is Meron Maragani. My office is on the seventh floor of Glennon Building. And my research is primarily around silicon carbide microelectromechanical systems and nanoelectrical electromechanical systems. Uh, I have about 15 view graphs. Uh, we'll try to race through them and then I have some time left for, for questions. So my interest in silicon carbide arises from the fact that there are many applications where silicon cannot go. Uh, these applications are typically known as harsh environment, but most notably high temperature and high radiation highly corrosive, uh, erosive environments and corrosive environments. And when we say high shock, this is extremely high shock on the order of 60,000 G and higher. And some of the, the missile systems actually require that sort of measurement in the presence of that, that level of shock, some of them going up to 200,000 G. Why silicon carbide uh, as, as its alternative choice to silicon? There are many semiconductor materials. Well, it's a stable material compatible with silicon in, in a silicon fabrication environment, which is important. Market opportunity compels investment because there is a lot of interest in power and RF electronics in silicon carbide that's funding the silicon carbide development. Therefore, we can take advantage of all of that investment that goes into silicon carbide. What motivates my interest and has motivated my program over a very long time in silicon carbide is essentially a suite of sensors for engine applications or, or propulsion and power. Uh, physical sensors to measure pressure, temperature, vibration, flow, particulate matter from exhaust, chemical sensors such as NOx, oxygen, carbon dioxide. What's important is for these sensors to work at 300 to 600 degrees C, but also work reliably. A combustion environment is a hot environment. Sensors don't necessarily need to sit in a combustion environment, which is much, much hotter than this but they have to be close enough to do the measurement. And if they can operate at high temperature, there's uh, much less overhead in terms of cooling. Benefits are fuel efficiency, emissions reduction, noise reduction, and reliability improvement from such systems. Uh, I mentioned why silicon carbide, a couple other points, wide band gap, outstanding mechanical properties, corrosion and erosion resistance, but also, as importantly, in silicon carbide, there is large area substrate technology and the ability to leverage silicon processes, therefore making the unit cost of devices very, very low, comparable to silicon, which is a quick, critical element for high volume applications like automotive. Uh, over the 90s, we've, we built a couple of key capabilities in silicon carbide in, in our microfabrication facility over in Bingham Building. Uh, we have an atmospheric pressure CVD reactor, chemical vapor deposition to put down silicon carbide either in single crystalline form and polycrystalline form. And we have an LPCVD reactor to put down polycrystalline films. Professor Zorman, who will also talk at this uh, colloquium, has done a lot of work with me over the years in silicon carbide, but probably will not touch on that today in, in his presentation. Uh, just to give you an example of, of a MEMS device, microelectromechanical uh, device that we fabricated in silicon carbide and all silicon carbide device, is a pressure sensor. Pressure is attractive for measuring internal combustion engine pressure. 
uh, to, to have optimal timing of ignition in each cylinder. And, and again, the key concept here is an all silicon carbide pressure sensor that can withstand high temperatures, corrosive environment, and <clears throat> is compatible with, with uh, electroplating potentially for wireless interface and can integrate in a package with an IC, which actually we, we've done quite a bit of work. I'll show you a picture of one uh, to, to create a, a complete sensor. Uh, we have designed, I had a PhD student by the name of Li Chen, who is now an engineer at Analog Devices in Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, he did this as part of his PhD thesis, so it gives you a feel as a, uh, to what a PhD thesis in my group is. It starts from the basic concept, uh, de design modeling, device fabrication, testing, and characterization. And uh, what Li Chen did was essentially do a mask design for pressure sensors up to uh, 1,500 psi. These devices have to withstand long, uh, large overpressure, usually a factor of three. Uh, reasonable sensitivity up to 20 kilohertz of bandwidth and temperature up to 600 degrees C. Uh, <clears throat> What, what you see here, actually, let me go to this first. What you see here on top right is the picture of a capacitive surface micromachine silicon carbide pressure sensor. I'm pointing to the diaphragm. This is the pressure sensing diaphragm that sits above the silicon carbide substrate or wafer by a couple of microns. When Pressure is applied, this diaphragm deflects, and the gap under the diaphragm to the substrate is modulated. So we, we essentially treat the diaphragm and electrode underneath sitting on the substrate as a parallel plate capacitor. These are the two connections to the two electrodes of the capacitor, one being the diaphragm that deflects in response to pressure. So we relate the change in the capacitance to the pressure applied. This device is fabricated in a six mask process and you don't really need to, to uh, understand the details of the fabrication process. Just the fact that we use four inch wafers in the microfabrication facility in Bingham building. You can put many, many devices on a four inch wafer. This device is 200 microns in diameter, about the diameter of a human hair. And it's fabricated in six masks. The cavity underneath the diaphragm is initially a silicon dioxide film. And then later on, it's etched through these holes. Once the cavity is etched and the diaphragm is freestanding, we seal the edge with this ring and create the sealed cavity. Uh, just to show you some. SEM photos of these sensors. Here are the seal that seals the cavity. Here is the diaphragm. Uh, these are the holes through which the, the, un, uh, the silicon dioxide under the diaphragm was dissolved to free up the diaphragm. You can see a magnified view of the surface of the film. Uh, <clears throat> In cross-section, you're seeing the silicon carbide wafer, the silicon carbide diaphragm, and the gap between the diaphragm and the bottom electrode forming the parallel plate capacitor. Here's a magnified view. The diaphragm is about two microns thick. This gap is about one and a half microns thick and the substrate. So you get a pretty good view of what this mask set and what this picture comes out to be after fabricated, okay? To actually design uh, these devices, uh, we do quite a bit of modeling. Most of the students in my group start with a, with a device concept, and then they do quite a bit of modeling, uh, multi-physics modeling, some is stress, some is thermal, some is electromagnetic field, to come up with the optimal dimensions and, and the structure then they do the, the mass designs and fabricate the devices. Uh, 
After fabrication, the next thing is characterization. So you see a, a bench top pressure chamber that my student Li Chen actually designed and fabricated with help from other group members. You see a large number of uh, capacitors put in parallel, pressure sensor elements put in parallel to get a large capacitance change. And what you see here is actually the capacitance change as a function of pressure, pressure load applied to about 100 PSI, while the temperature is changed up to 575 degrees and a reasonably linear behavior from the sensor. So the sensor is actually capable to operate operation verified to 574 degrees. I'm going to skip these details and just show you that <coughs> this sensor, the silicon carbide sensor, which is the red, red curve, was tested, essentially packaged in a stainless steel tube by Li Chen and tested in a test engine in mechanical engineering department. They have a test engine that runs alcohol as a fuel and they actually have a reference research sensor. And you can see that our sensor tracks the research sensor very well, but it, even, it has better sensitivity at very low pressure. So again, it sort of verifies that you can fabricate these devices, put them in a combustion chamber, and measure the change in pressure. Uh, I've had an active collaboration with Professor Garbrick <coughs> in our department to fabricate silicon carbide electronics to go with the silicon carbide capacitive sensors. Capacitive sensors have a high impedance node. In order to make a complete sensor, you not only need the transducer element, which I showed you, but you actually need to have interface electronics right next to the transducer element. Uh, so an example of collaboration in our group here is an example, another example of collaboration in my group. This is with Professor Bohunia uh, in our department as well. It essentially looks at silicon carbide for, for high temperature mechanical computing by making these nanomechanical switches. And a PhD student in my group, Teha Li, is working on this project. And uh, essentially what we have are electrodes on both sides of this can freestanding cantilever. By exciting these electrodes, we can make the cantilever touch to one side or another, close one side of the switch or, or the other side of the switch. So this is just a one view graph perspective on, on our nanoelectromechanical systems work. Uh, there are about 10 PhD students in my group, one master's student. Most of the work essentially is of the type of flavor you saw here. Uh, if there are one or two quick questions before I turn the floor over to Professor Zorman. Great, Chris, here it is. Please put this on. biomedical microsystems. So just in case you're not not high enough, it's, uh, is it on now? Okay, good. So in, in the event that you're not familiar with the acronym MEMS, it's sh short for microelectromechanical systems. And this graph that I actually borrowed from Professor Maragani many years ago kind of gives a brief synopsis of what MEMS technology is. You haven't figured out already, it consists of the integration of microsensors, microactuators with enabling electronics to um, enable uh, perception and control of the local environment. And if you array these sensor technologies into mass groups, then you can actually get better than local control. And 
Case Western Reserve University has had a long history in MEMS um, research and development. Professor Maragani talked about his work in harsh environment, MEMS focusing primarily on high temperature, high corrosion, and I did work with him for many years, and uh, more recently I've taken a split and moved into another area that's arguably harsh, which would be the biomedical arena, especially in device applications that would involve medical implants. And I have a collaboration with the Department of Veterans Affairs uh, Lewis Stokes Medical Center to develop microsystems for neurointerfacing. And it's, a, it's a, an approach and it's an effort that extends upon a long track record of such technologies that's been going on here at Case for uh, about 20 years or so to make a neural interface to enable those who suffer from paralysis either in the arms, the legs, or the both, or both to move again by stimulating the nervous system, m muscles, and the like through electrical signals. And this graph here, cartoon here, shows a brief schematic of the currently existing system, and it consists of a control unit that's external to the body, a wireless link, an implantable microprocessor, and then leads that go to various nerves and muscles. A blow-up view photograph of the actual system is shown here, and if we were to examine what possibly could be connectors at the end that would interface biologically, we show, see this micrograph here. And in all cases at present, the systems are large and or hand or man-crafted. So there's a lot of opportunity for microfabrication technology in this arena. We envision systems of the future to move from that shown here to that shown in this cartoon on the right-hand side, where the microprocessor, the neural interface, and communications technologies would all be at the point of use, which would be coupled to the nerve, thereby miniaturizing large systems like this and allowing for decentralization and perhaps then massive arraying. That's going to be made possible if we can identify the proper materials and microfabrication technologies to realize such systems. So my group is actually uh, working in that area. And I'd like to take a couple minutes to show you a cartoon sequence of a typical fabrication process. We generally don't work with silicon as a primary structural material in our group, but rather polymeric materials that are mechanically flexible, with the idea that mechanical flexibility would provide a better biological interface. We do, however, rely on silicon heavily in the fabrication process for no other reason than to support the material that we're going to fabricate the devices out of. So we start with a silicon wafer, then we use a photoresist to adhere our substrate, which in this illustration is liquid crystal polymer. For those who are familiar with electronics packaging, you would recognize liquid crystal polymer as flex circuit technology material. We find that it's biocompatible and mechanically rugged, so it works very well for our neurointerfaces. We then would spin coat some photoresist, pattern the photoresist using conventional lithographic patterning techniques into structures that would resemble electrodes. We would deposit the electrode material right onto the substrate. In our case, platinum is the principal material. Sometimes we use gold, and we're looking to use other ones like uh, indium oxide and the like. We would then perform a simple lift off of the unwanted platinum that sits on top of the pattern photoresist, leaving behind then patterned metal that sits directly atop the liquid crystal polymer. We need a capping layer to electrically isolate the interconnect traces from the environment. So we use a, a novel spin castable photodefinable polymer that's actually developed by a company here in Northeast Ohio called Avatril. It's a polyneuroboronine. We put that on a thin layer, roughly 5 to 10 microns. Then we're able to photolithographically pattern it. It's now in this darker opening windows to the metal electrodes and contact pads and exposing large areas of the LCP. I should mention here the LCP is not photodefinable. So in order to, to um, pattern the LCP, we use laser micromachining techniques. And we have a laser micromachining tool in, in our lab in the Glennon building. And that allows us then to literally cut out the unwanted LCP. And then we simply dip the, um, the wafer into acetone, which dissolves that adhering photoresist, allowing the device to be released. Here are some illustrative 
pictures that show some of the devices we've built. Um, if you're a little squeamish for bio stuff, just ignore that panel there. This is a, a, a peripheral nerve electrode that's designed to actually wrap around a peripheral nerve. And peripheral nerves are found in your arms, and they run from, of course, your neck region down to your arm and to your hand. And a surgeon would simply wrap the peripheral nerve electrode around the nerve, as shown here, stitch it into place with some simple sutures, connect it, in this case, since we're still in early development, to uh, associated PCB that connects you to the uh, necessary electronics to allow for testing of the devices. Now, unfortunately, the movie that I have that sits underneath this uh, picture here isn't running on this computer, but I could show you offline that our devices actually work. We put a stimulating pulse onto this test subject, which was a macaque, and when the pulse is, is applied, then the hand begins to move. So, of course, we've got a long way to go to implement the technology in an implantable fashion. A lot of work is required in actually moving away from the PC board technology, but if, of course, the electrodes don't work, then why bother? We're not st stuck solely on working on peripheral nerve electrodes. We'd also like to look at cortical electrodes. There's a lot of uh, interest in developing brain-machine interfaces. And if you were to scour the literature, you'd see there's a number of approaches already in play, some built on silicon as the primary structural material, others built on conventional polymers. But we have collaborators here at CASE that have developed a polymer that exhibits a chemo-responsive behavior, meaning that when it is exposed to moisture, its modulus, Young's modulus, reduces by about three to four orders of magnitude. We're envisioning this kind of a polymeric system to be ideal for a cortical implant where you would like the implant to be stiff upon insertion because literally the surgeon would implant it into the brain through the tissue, then after insertion become compliant to the tissue and in, in ideal sense match the mechanical properties of the tissue. So this is some pretty early stage work, but we were able to find, or my colleagues over in macromolecular science were able to find a, uh, a bio analog, and it's the sea cucumber. And that sea cucumber's defense mechanism relies upon this kind of a stiff to soft uh, change in mat its material properties. My grad student, Allison Hess, a PhD student, has come up with fabrication technologies to make uh, the first prototypes of the cortical probe, as shown here. This is a two electrode shank, and um, we're moving from the simple structures to a more complex design that would in incorporate. This is a simple structure that's completely covered with metal. Our, our next prototype designs have isolated electrodes along the shank. We've done some preliminary mechanical properties testing, and we found that, indeed, the, the material behaves as advertised. We find that when the samples dry, the Young's modulus, using simple te uh, tensile testing techniques, is about 4 gigapascals. When the sample is wetted, it drops down to 6.1 megapascals, and it's reversible, at least to some extent, although this is really preliminary data. Our collaborators say that the mechanism is as such. This polymer is a nano-enabled because it incorporates nanofibers that are extracted from the sea cucumber. Those fibers interact in an intertwining matrix when dry, giving stiffness to a relatively soft polymer, which is the base material. It's it's called uh, PVAC. When it uptakes moisture, hydrogen bonds that are holding the fibers together become weakened. The fibers then don't impart a stiffness onto the matrix polymer, and it becomes soft as the matrix polymer. And we see here tensile testing that verify that. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to move from the polymer work that we do back towards some silicon work we do. And I'll highlight the research of Ross Smith, who's a, a, another PhD student in my group. And his interest area is in evaluating nanoporous membranes for biofiltration applications. There's a couple of dr bio drivers for this research. One would be to build a art bio-artificial kidney, and the other one would be a bio-artificial um, pancreas. And in each case, these systems require uh, sophisticated filtration for them to function. We've um, opted for silicon as a structural material for our nanofilter membranes because of a couple attributes. 
notably its mechanical durability, its uh, versatility in micromachining, and the ability to use uh, thermal oxidation processes to form very thin spacers that can be configured into very thin uh, pores. I don't have a lot of time to go into the details, but I will highlight this one SEM micrograph here that shows the formation of a 42 nanometer wide channel between two large silicon plates. Here's a cross-sectional view outward, and it shows this is about a four to five micron thick silicon film, and there are these really thin channels that permeate the, uh, the thin film. We've actually fabricated pores with critical dimensions as small as five nanometers. We find these things are, are excellent as a uh, use as a filter. We haven't made the bioartificial organs yet, but we've tested them for water filtration applications, and we find that they are actually excellent at reducing endotoxin levels, which is kind of a nasty thing that's found in, much, uh, in many water sources down to uh, medical grade standards. And we think that there's a, a lot of opportunities here in uh, developing um, uh, water filtration uh, cartridges out of these nanoporous membranes. One issue with membranes, however, is fouling. When a membrane fouls, it will no longer filter, or a filter fouls, it'll no longer filter. And so we're interested in coming up with surfaces that are anti-fouling. And then the last minute or so, I'll draw a link back to the silicon carbide research we do here at CASE by saying that I was inspired by my colleagues' work in silicon carbide and thought there would be a play here um, on the bio side. Most of our, our um, materials and biomedical micro devices can't tolerate the high temperatures that one would use to grow the high quality single and polycrystalline material for the high temperature MEMS. So we switched to an amorphous phase of silicon carbide, which can be deposited at temperatures from about 30 degrees C up to 400 C. And what we found with this amorphous silicon carbide is that it doesn't have a surface that's very favorable to bioattachment. As you can see here in this micrograph, the light blue represents attachment of proteins on various surfaces. And here we have polysilicon, silicon nitride, single crystal silicon, and silicon dioxide. Highlighted in red is silicon carbide. The uncoated, when I mean by uncoated, un-PEG coated silicon carbide shows a um, propensity to inhibit attachment, but when it's coated with PEG, which is a special surface coating used in many biomicro devices, it really does not support attachment. Not only does it support, not a support attachment after 12 days of exposure, but it retains that property over at least 60 days of exposure. So while this research is still relatively new, we think that there is a play for silicon carbide in biomedical micro devices. And it may not just be limited to amorphous silicon carbide as well. It could also be a property that's retained by the polycrystalline and the single crystal silicon carbide. Um, all of the work we do and the work I do in my group is done by grad students and uh, CASE is an excellent set of facilities to support this work. If you haven't been over already, there's a, basically a silicon pilot plant operation on the third floor of Bingham where these uh, photographs were taken. And in there, you can make just about any, any MEMS device that you can envision. And, uh, and it's all student, uh, student used, which is a real blessing. I'll close by saying that uh, my research can't go forward without some really uh, first-rate collaborators. The work I talked about today is uh, on the neurointerfacing side is primarily with Dustin Tyler in the biomedical engineering department and the biofiltration side with Shuvo Roy and Aaron Fleischman at the Cleveland Clinic. My group is of modest size right now but looking to grow. We have about five or six graduate students and we receive support from a variety of sources including the Vet Department of Veterans Affairs, National Science Foundation, and NASA. And uh, if it looks like time is a little bit tight, but I could take a question or two while Professor Lynn gets up here and gets ready to go. Take your time. Take your time. Any questions? Well, I'll be around after, so if you can think of some, we'll take them then. OK, Professor Lynn. He needs a few seconds to get set up, so, yes. so maybe. While he's setting up, 
questions for either myself or Professor Maragani, or about what we talked about, or about uh, anything else that might be of interest to you as a grad student in our department. So can I use my own computer or? Yeah, yeah, you sure you can. Um, here would oh, be I the can, interface, can, yeah. Okay, oh, another way, I think it's just plug it into the uh, Or yeah, it's what, yeah, or you can just, yeah, right here. Okay, so See that slot right there? Uh -huh. Get it aligned. You need, you need house lights? Okay. Do it here while you're. Let's see if we, we can. Uh, okay, let's see. This is that oh, one. I see the device. Oh, you do? Well, let me get my stuff off the screen. Okay. Okay. And here's a laser pointer if you want. Maybe you just want to cancel that and go right into my computer. It may be just. It's got to be that one. Nope. Maybe it's removable disk. There you go. Is the mic still on? Okay, good. Yeah. All right. I'm not familiar with PC. Okay. So go to slideshow right up here. See that button? Okay. Yeah. From beginning. No, this is from beginning. Yeah. Okay. okay. And here you go. You're going to need that mic so he can pick you up on your tape. Okay. Your okay. Laser pen. Oh, okay. Hello. No, I probably just. Can you hear me? Okay, I just give a brief introduction about uh, what I'm doing and uh, what is the, my previous research and what is my uh, future interest and uh, ongoing research. So, uh, as you can see over here, my in the last ten years, my research focus has been on the control. So I'm from I'm the faculty in the system control, and my main focus is on nonlinear control with applications, in particular. Uh, the application to the uh, biologically inspired system and MAV and also recently uh, I'm working with uh, Professor Jenk on a kind of the telelubatic system uh, using the lubatics or telelubatic to do the uh, heart surgery and the more recently my I think the the current uh, my research is going to be focused on the wind energy power system and smart grid network so uh, my teaching, you can see that. How do I move these things down? It's too small. So, uh, in terms of teaching, uh, I have been teaching the linear system. And if some of you, if you take my linear system class, you know that I'm teaching linear system, no linear control and as well as some robust control and optimal control. So uh, another thing I'm teaching for undergraduate students is like a, a 246 and a 304, 304 control engineering and applications. I have been also teaching the uh, EECS 214 for mechanical engineering students, where the, uh, nowadays control application is much more active than the EE department. Uh, in terms of uh, research, uh, in the past decade, my research has been mainly founded by the NSF, uh, from the both the uh, electric engineering division or electric and system division, and also from a division of the mathematical science. So my research is more uh, theoretical oriented, but more and more my research is moving into the applied area. So one of the uh, research uh, has been focused on is on the. Uh, control of a class of nonlinear system using the non-smooth feedback. Uh, as you might know, 
from the 80s to the 2000s, the main focus of the control area has been on the nonlinear control using the differential geometry technology. So you, you can basically model the uh, physical system under the consideration using the ordinary differential equation. Of course, if you are dealing with like a fluid dynamic or the more complicated process, the model may be is a partial differential equation to present. And, but somehow you always can do the, a number of the, uh, simplifications so that you can use either the state space model to represent the linearization or you want to capture the major uh, dynamic property of the nonlinearity in the system, then you are end up with a nonlinear differential equation. So then the issue becomes how to uh, do the system analysis and the design for the control of nonlinear system. And in the past, I think two decades, the focus has been on using a smooth nonlinear feedback design. So my focus has been using the non-smooth instead of smooth feedback design. Of course, the reason why we have to use the non-smooth feedback design is there is a number of the problem, in particular in the mechanical system, such as the, like uh, underactuated mechanic system or non-harmonic mechanical system. They cannot be controlled by any linear feedback we have been uh, experienced, such as the PID control and so on. But uh, it can also not be controlled by the uh, so-called smooth nonlinear control. So we have to somehow rely on the non-smooth technique. So my research also is heavily related to the, uh, if you learn advanced calculus, so-called a non-smooth analysis. So basically, we, we develop a number of uh, systematic design methodology for um, how to design the non-smooth controller for this type of nonlinear system. And uh, the application to this type of problem is mainly on the like a non-harmonic system, as I mentioned, and also the mobile robot with the non-harmonic constraint and the uh, underactive the mechanical system. So the uh, one of the, uh, the application project recently was supported by, the, uh, in addition to the NSF support, is supported by the uh, Air Force uh, Research Laboratory. So this is a joint research working with uh, a number of the people in the Air Force and also with uh, orbital research in the Cleveland. So they basically uh, try to design a small MAV or small uh, helicopter and so that you can remote control them and then they can do the certain tracking and uh, get s some information from the uh, hazard area, for instance. And uh, another research I had is uh, I think it's related to the MAV I mentioned over here. And more recently, yeah, this, the, the last one you can see that. Uh, the more recent one is the design and the tracking of controller for robotic tele, uh, surgical system. So this is a kind of the joint work with uh, Professor Jenk Chikasolo. So we, what we try to do here is we want to uh, find a more rigorous mathematical model for hard bit motion. And then, then the, we translate this problem into the, a kind of the tracking problem. And since the robotic system with the uh, 60 degree of the freedom is kind of the underactuated mechanical system. So it's related to the second research I mentioned over, the first one I mentioned over here. And so this is like a, a kind of the tracking problem and you can formulate this tracking problem into the output regulation problem which I taught in the uh, 520 robust control. And so this is kind of the very challenging problem. Right now I think the, the, the key issue is not whether we can achieve the tracking. The key is we want to achieve the so-called high precision tracking. The current technology or current controller, for instance, if you're using a PD controller which is commonly used in a robotic control, uh, we only can achieve like a 0.46 uh, millimeter tracking error. So that the tracking error can be reduced to that kind of a range. But indeed, in order to get a successful, for, for example, if you want to do the uh, appendix surgery, so the tracking error want to get reduced from like a 0.1 millimeter. So from 0.4 to 0.1, uh, this is indeed is nearly a very challenging task. So right now we are thinking uh, uh, two or three different uh, 
nonlinear technology which want to take advantage of the nonlinearity of the Lubatica manipulator. And so that the, the controller itself not only can compensate uh, the nonlinearity, but also can improve the tracking performance. Most of the time, I mean, if the, your tracking performance, uh, for instance, like an uh, industry process, if you do not require that type of the high precision tracking, I think the general PD controller or PID controller or even the uh, LQ based on the linear state space design were sufficient, will be sufficient. But in our current uh, environment, because of the high precision tracking requirement, we have to rely on the nonlinear technology. And we hope a nonlinear design tool can help in this regard. Okay? So this is the ongoing research, and uh, we still working on this problem with uh, Professor Jenkins' student and his poster and my student. And another thing I want to mention is, uh, finally, I want to mention something. This is what I already briefly mentioned, but I think the more my, my, my current research interest is on uh, energy-related research. And as you know, we already hired uh, one faculty from the Spain who is going to be working on the wind energy and uh, uh, related area. And I'm currently trying to work with the people from the Austin Power. We, we already get some financial support and funding support from their company. And um, I'm still working on the, like a coal process. But eventually, they also want to go from the coal process to the renewable energy. And my personal interest is, uh, I think one thing I mentioned over here, I need to go to the my computer, right? I want to show you the one slide uh, which summarizes what, what my current interest, which is Present in the energy slide. Okay, over here. So this is the. Uh, okay. So this is the area I'm I'm currently interested in right now, and we want to work on uh, the so-called smart power grid network. So that. Uh, some of the uh, the ones the control technology might be able to apply to this kind of problem, and we want to. The purpose is we we, we have a, a whole bunch of the sensor and actuators around a power system network, and then the question is whether we can transform the electronic power grid, uh, in a, or we can design some intelligent device to generate or to transmit the powers more efficiently. So this is the, another area I'm currently interested in. And uh, indeed, I'm learning of this kind of material. And uh, I'm asking, uh, I'm, I'm correcting some of the materials from uh, my student and also from the, my own readings so that we hopefully we can work on in this area in the future. That's pretty much what I want to say. So, and my office is in all in six or seven. So if you have any questions or uh, regarding my research, you can still come to my office. Any questions? Do you have a USB? So I need to take it. So I need to remove the But uh, I will have to find any like No, it's over here. So it's over here. Uh, I need to take it out. Thank you. Just to pull it out? There's another one yeah. There's, There's another one, one over there? Yeah. There's two. You're okay. Okay. I can find whatever I can. Where is it? Where's mine? Uh, go to the, my computer. You close this window. I think so. Yeah, you close this. It's there. And then go to the nice. Oh, it's already there? Is this one or this one? No, no, go to my computer. You need to see the, your device first. Yeah. The movable device. This one? Yeah. 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 And now I have to find the thing. Yeah. And then you have to put this on, put this on Chris, for the camera. Okay. Microphone. Just let me find what yeah. I have. Because I did put this. It's thing. already on, so.
Ah, maybe this one. Okay. And then just what, go what to is, what do this? Just put it on your... What is this, for speaker? It's a microphone. Okay. So I don't put this in your pocket. Okay. Okay. Uh, I have a pocket. Yeah, go to the flash show. Sorry. No. Uh, all right, all right. Uh, hi, uh, my name is there. I've been here for quite a while, longer than the other guys. <laughs> and uh, uh, there are several projects we have um, in uh, our group, and I've advised uh, several students. Um, uh, I couldn't get all the transparency, so I got on, on a focus project, which actually I don't seem to have. A, um, I have only one student in that. Student in that. So it is uh, a more mature project, which uh, has been funded from the Air Force and Wright-Patterson. But uh, I, we have uh, several other newer projects uh, which are dealing with uh, entirely different topics, uh, okay. As in particular, reliability or um, embedded systems and reliability of semiconductor devices. Anyway, I'll be talking about this project, which is more mature, on configurable and evolvable hardware systems, which has been going over quite some time. And we have several publications. Uh, let me show a reconfigurable. First of all, what is reconfigurable? I deleted quite a few transparencies. Uh, the ability of a device, embedded system, etc., to configure itself, meaning configuring its uh, functionality or even its structure, uh, which can be done uh, statically, that means offline, or even dynamically, uh, partially or fully, which means uh, online. Okay, under uh, instructions or under command. Uh, this ability is generally called the reconfigurability. The spectrum of reconfigurability uh, of devices, uh, which has been evolving over the years, uh, is shown here. Uh, oh, I can go back. It's very touchy. Okay, uh, so first we have the fixed hardware down here which is not configurable, okay, like a, a device, any kind of a very, very fixed hardware device, okay, like an adder, a multiplier, it's, and so on. Then uh, in the second phase, the configurable device appeared, first uh, like programmable arrays, programmable logic arrays, and then FPGAs, okay, they appeared. And um, within the green area, we still have um, static, but at the end of the green area, we have uh, the dynamic reconfigurability appearing, in a partial sense, uh, which uh, means that a part of the chip, of the configurable chip, like an FPGA, an advanced FPGA, could be configured at runtime, okay? Uh, where the other, part, the other part of the chip uh, would uh, be essentially not reconfigurable dynamically. And uh, beyond the green spectrum, we have the area of self-reconfigurability. Uh, that is defined as the ability of a device, an embedded system or whatever, to configure itself subject to ambient signals and uh, conditions. Uh, this is something which um, has been approached in the research domain, but not really practiced. There are no so self-configurable devices in the market right now. Although there is a need in the future, uh, of course, and this needs addressed, especially by military, NASA, etc. cetera. Uh, then we have the fourth so-called generation phase in the configurability spectrum, which uh, attaches the evolvable systems and uh, systems which are subjected to evolution in hardware and software. Software evolution is, of course, much easier, and people in um, the algorithms domain have worked a lot. But hardware evolutions, evolution, although there have been quite a few successful experiments, uh, of course, they are far away. Uh, evolvability means the ability of a device to evolve itself uh, in the sense of um, growth. Okay, like having a transistor, not of course a transistor to grow itself, but a circuit to draw, grow itself. Examples have been uh, appearing in, the, in practice in some laboratories, but uh, it's far away. Perhaps uh, uh, this technology is beyond CMOS, and as people have uh, expressed and uh, argued, and perhaps newer technologies, biological inspired, etc., may be more amenable to evolution of hardware. Okay, whatever hardware means at that time. Okay, uh, this is a traditional FPGA, which is fixed, okay, as you can see, cell arrays, etc. And uh, this, uh, uh, of course, uh, was the fixed and static configurable devices, which uh, we have in our laboratories, devices like that. 
Uh, and this um, has been advanced now to more partially reconfigurable or dynamically configurable devices, the so-called uh, Vertex 2, for example, or Vertex 4 architecture, where you can see some areas can be configured uh, dynamically uh, on operation. Configuration is done, of course, by <coughs> producing the software, configurable software, which means uh, essentially uh, a pattern of bits which will uh, change the structure of the device and as, as such change the functionality. This is done with uh, tools, advanced tools, which are running off workstations. And the configuration, which is a big program, is uh, downloaded, uh, is streamed essentially into the chip, and uh, then uh, essentially this uh, will change the functionality and performance and as I say, the personality of the chip. But uh, dynamically, this can be done at runtime in some way, and statically, of course, uh, the rest of the chip. Uh, Self-reconfiguration, again, is a research area, and we have been working on that for a while. Okay, it's a, as a sort of loose definition. Uh, it's a way of dynamic reconfiguration, but uh, it is not done on command, okay? It is done essentially in response to outside signals, that's um, uh, ambience, for example. For example, if you have a sensory uh, signals uh, which respond to rise of temperature or uh, other conditions, it is uh, this um, uh, sensory could essentially um, be the reason for a self configuration for essentially the chip to configure, to respond better into these particular conditions. Okay. Uh, again, as I said, this is uh, an area of intense research, but um, there are no products like that in practice. Uh, just the potential for self-configuration applications, it seems to be great. Everything is great in the future. Okay. Sp uh, NASA is particularly interested, has been traditionally interested in uh, approaches and techniques for self-configuration and even evolvable configuration. Uh, but also military and commercial satellites, UAVs and micro UAVs, mini UAVs. We've done some work in that area um, rather recently, from the, I mean, based, uh, funded by the Air Force, uh, where a small, very small devices, tiny devices, can be self reconfigured to, response, to respond to needs okay, because, uh, of the practice. Definitely, they need, the UAVs need to be reconfigurable in some sense, but they can be even self reconfigurable if, uh, uh, because the needs are there. Okay. Uh, also, deep underwater rescue or uh, hostile environments in general would be an area where self configuration together with sensory uh, would be a very good research area and uh, example applications. Nuclear and chemical plants, hostile environments in general, and autonomous robotics also, micro robotics would be an area where self reconfigurability reconfigura would be a very good um, uh, property for uh, uh, these applications. So there are many great applications. Some of them actually would be useful today, like deep underwater rescue, nuclear chemical plants, etc. Some uh, even in robotics, in some sense. UAVs, of course, are very important. UAVs are important not only for the military; it could be important to do a lot of observations. Uh, for example, observations for uh, several disasters like uh, uh, fires or storms, etc. So uh, it is something very important, and uh, you need these devices to be self reconfigurable, especially the micro UAVs, which are very, very low flying, and they have uh, a lot of these capabilities. And of course, military and uh, NASA space exploration. Uh, this is just a small example, transparency I've shown several times, about uh, the sensory web which is planned by NASA and where you can see self reconfiguration or reconfiguration of satellites is most desirable uh, to observe an event. For example, they can reconfigure the device to address the resolution issue of cameras or uh, of other sensory. Uh, normally, resolution is, could be low, but uh, if an event happens, resolution can be increased, which means on the fly, and this has to be done uh, uh, yeah, by the reconfiguration capability of the device, the satellite device, and uh, to respond to the need. Um, uh, because you normally you don't want to have a high resolution because it's costly. Don't forget that these devices are power hungry and uh, you don't have very much uh, energy capability on satellites. Okay, so far, even if you have uh, solar energy, still it's limited. Therefore, you don't want to have very high resolution uh, and observatory uh, things which uh, consume very much energy, except if there's a need. And also, uh, high resolution means uh, much more difficult in communication because uh, that will increase the communication uh, demand 
Okay, but anyway, when there's an event, you, then you can self-reconfigure the device. I mean, you, the device should self-reconfigure itself in response to the event and transmit uh, the additional um, uh, streams into nearby satellites. In fact, the device can choose which satellites to, would be better, uh, bec then depending on uh, or the demands, okay, and uh, the data rates. Anyway, um, a Volvo hardware now uh, is another category, in fact, the first phase of reconfigurability. And uh, they can change the architecture and behavior dynamically and autonomously. But at present, the evolvability, as I said, is not really feasible, except in some uh, I mean, uh, uh, very specialized laboratory cases. Okay? Um, you need an adaptation mechanism which will adapt the hardware, but not in the sense of self-growth uh, that uh, the living organisms are going through. Okay? Uh, ultimately, that's the goal of evolved hardware, to have uh, techniques and hardware and uh, uh, technologies which will allow self-growth um, of uh, the hardware devices. But CMOS is not uh, amenable to this kind of uh, self-growth. So right now, uh, the way we approach evolvability in the interim period is by evolving our software techniques and adaptation. Uh, and and to, 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 they will have a two-fold approach, adaptation of um, software and essentially reconfigurability of hardware. And uh, both together, they work to have uh, uh, essentially an approach to evolve hardware. How much am I doing time? Am I done? Two more minutes. OK, this is an example of uh, uh, evolvability which is inspired from nature. Uh, OK, but uh, of course, this is only the goal and inspiration. It's not a reality. Uh, this is an example of a laboratory, um, I believe, at JPL, where they attempted to do evolvability. But um, essentially, the approach is uh, extreme at the point. At the point. But so the, uh, the approach which we have uh, uh, used in evolvability is uh, using evolution of, of software and reconfigurability in hardware in order to essentially implement this concept. It's an interim period. It can, we cannot possibly at the moment have full level of build of hardware. This is an approach which uh, followed, which is a two-level approach, uh, which works at the software level, at the, and the bottom line is the configurable hardware. And all together, you, you give yourself reconfiguration. I will uh, go through, uh, the, it requires some training process through neural networks. And this, we actually have several papers on this, and uh, this approach. Um, uh, seems to be reasonable for the time being. And also, it is an approach which can be implemented um, in practice. Anyway, summary and future, we can have essentially, self, we have self-reconfigurability and evolvability. Uh, the evolvability based on, uh, by inspired paradigm, uh, is not at the moment realizable. Okay, be, but in the future, there will be need to integrate seamless technologies of software and neural network technologies, which will do the evolvability at the software level, and also dynamic reconfigura reconfiguration to perform uh, the implementation at the hardware level. So my talk focused on a particular area of research o o on which I was uh, busy for quite some time, five, the last five years at least. But uh, we're doing quite a lot of other things uh, uh, in entirely different areas, and uh, I don't have time to talk about it. And, um, Okay, right now, but uh, any any, anybody who has interest, please stop by and talk to me. Yeah, I, I was doing work as in particular in the area of reliability of uh, embedded systems and sem semiconductor systems. Uh, okay, it's subjected to soft errors and also subject to aging and these sort of things. But uh, there are several other projects I'm, I have been involved in the area of embedded uh, systems. Okay, so. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. So, what am I doing this? I unplug it. Thanks very much, everyone. And uh, not to leave with this.